Mark, thank you so much for coming on the Easy Prey podcast today. Thanks for having me, Chris. It's great to be here. So can you give myself and the audience a little bit of background about who you are and what you do? Sure. So I am uh, Mark Verheimenam. I'm a strategic futurist, which means that I think about emerging technologies and how they change organizations and society. Uh, so that means uh, from big data to blockchain to AI to uh, the metaverse to um, generative AI, synthetic media, from everything that's, that's emerging and that's going to change our world. Uh, I'm also um, a keynote speaker, so I, I help Fortune 500 companies understand these you know, difficult technologies and what they mean for them. Uh, I've written five books, of which my fourth book was called Step Into the Metaverse, which is all about the metaverse. And my fifth book is called Future Visions, which was written in five days uh, with ChatGPT. Um, I was, I think I was the first one in the world to publish the book with ChatGPT. By now, there are dozens of them uh, available, uh, but uh, I hold the claim to fame <laughs> to have written the first. Um, and um, I run a, a, a media platform called Datavlog, um, uh, which is all around emerging technologies. And I've just started a research institute focused around uh, um, elevating the world's digital awareness to ensure a thriving digital future, because I'm actually quite worried uh, worried about the digital future of where we're heading. Um, and I think you know, education is required to do so based on, on in-depth research. Um, and um, I've been doing that myself for over a decade, past decade. You know, I practice what I preach. I try to use, use these technologies myself. Um, and so I can help others uh, understand them as well. Awesome. So I, I have to ask you, the book written by ChatGPT in five days, to anyone reading it, does it look like it was written by ChatGPT? It doesn't. Um, oh, okay. um, um, it, it doesn't. Um, uh, until you reach the end, then you start to see the patterns uh, in it. Um, uh, it, it. It's a good book. It's definitely not as good as my, my books that I wrote myself. Um, it's, it's a lot more flat. Uh, but um, all, all in all, I think it's it's a it's a it's a pretty okay book, um, and um, uh, the process was actually quite interesting to to do so because ChatGPT came to market I think on December first. First, I started writing on December fifth, um, and I published uh, on December twelfth. So uh, a week, including editing and everything, uh, was a week time. Um, um, what I did is I asked ChatGPT, okay, we're going to write a book. Um, um, uh, tell me about technologies and how they will define our future. Which technologies are going to define our future? So I came back with several technologies. Um, I added some of my own technologies. And then for each technology, I asked, um, how, which questions do I need to ask you in order to answer how these technologies are going to define us? Um, so I gave, gave a list of questions, um, and I used those questions as prompts to have a conversation and uh, sometimes asking follow-up questions. And I, I, I used the return of the answer of ChatGPT um, and put it into the manuscript. I didn't change the wording and didn't change anything re related to that. Um, I might have changed some sentences moving it up or, up or down. Um, and of course, I removed the, the factual errors, which were which were in there quite, quite a bit. Um, <laughs> uh, so I removed those, um, and, uh, but that, that's about it. And then I, had it, uh, I edited it with Grammarly. Um, so I didn't do manual editing or, or human editing myself. Uh, I used AI to do that as well. And when I was finished, I asked ChatGPT, okay, now give me a title that came up with Future Visions. Uh, I said, give me a subtitle, uh, give me a description for the book, um, for the cover, uh, give me a description, which I entered into um, a stable diffusion, uh, which gave me the design for the, for the, for the cover of the book. Um, and then I asked to finish off, now write me a, a review, and it wrote me a raving review how good the book was. So <laughs> pretty good. I would hope ChatGPT would give itself a good review. Yeah, you would hope so. <laughs> and it did, I can tell you. <laughs> did you give it, uh, we'll get to the main topic here in a minute. Did you end up uh, giving it any instructions on voice and tone and personality? No, no, none of that. Um, I just um, uh, talked about, they had basically had a conversation about it. Um, and um, I didn't give any, any instructions uh, for, based on tone of voice or to mimic my tone of voice. Um, uh, so that's, that was quite interesting. And But the, the, the more I, I did it, you start to see patterns. And it, it used the same pattern to answer the questions, yeah. uh, but just replacing one technology for another and then replacing some future outcomes for a different future outcomes. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, it, it, it came up with a lot of bollocks sometimes. Uh, you know, at some point, I asked it, uh, um, um, how did AI and robotics converge? And it uh, stated, well, in the 1980s, robotics and AI converged to create self-driving cars that changed transportation. <laughs> if only it had happened, you know, <laughs> the world would have been so much better now. Uh, but unfortunately, that's not the case. Um, so uh, we don't live in a parallel universe uh, and, and we still have to deal with traffic jams. <laughs> uh, parallel universe actually works really well when discussing metaverse, doesn't it? It does. Absolutely. <laughs> so, so let's talk about the metaverse and the risks that it presents to us 
I won't necessarily, well, there's probably some risks today, but then they're probably different than future risks. So let's talk about what is the metaverse? Sure. So what is the metaverse is always a, a bit of a loaded question uh, because everyone has different perspective on what the metaverse is. Um, and, and for my book, um, uh, Step Into the Metaverse, I asked um, about, I interviewed about 250 people, um, uh, 100 in-depth interviews, uh, 150 surveys, and I got 250 different definitions of what the metaverse is, uh, which sort of shows you that it, it is a difficult uh, uh, and a very abstract concept for people to grasp. Uh, so for, for me, what the metaverse is for me, well, first let's say what the metaverse is not. Uh, because I think there's a lot of um, you know misconception about the metaverse that the metaverse equals uh, gaming or the metaverse equals virtual reality or the metaverse equals Web three. Um, I think this is this is not true. Um, uh, I think the, the the metaverse can be all of the above, but mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be. Um, so uh, what is the metaverse to me? The metaverse to me is uh, where the physical and the digital worlds converge. So the physical moving into the digital and the digital moving into the physical and creating this so-called digital experience where we have you know, an immersive uh, uh, internet, basically. Um, so the metaverse is nothing more than just the next iteration of the internet. Right? We've moved from you know, the very first web um, uh, to uh, the, the social web to the, the mobile web, and now we're moving to the metaverse, um, uh, which is uh, we move from a 2D internet to a 3D internet um, where you know uh, we, we we move from making a uh, having to make a conscious decision to go on the internet. Eh? You have to use your smartwatch or you have to use your phone or whatsoever to an internet that's as pervasive as the air we breathe, and we are part of the internet. We are in the internet, um, and that's where we're moving. Now, there's a lot of information in this, this little description, but uh, uh, to, to, to give a sort of um, uh, additional context, you know, if you move from uh, the, the physical into the digital, you could argue that that's what we're doing at the moment. You know, uh, you are physically um, uh, uh, on on the west coast of of of, uh, of of the United States. I am physically on the east coast of the of Australia, um, and we are converging and we're meeting in the digital world to have this conversation. Yeah. So you could argue that this is sort of a very this is sort of part of the of an early version of the metaverse. Um, <clears throat> but it also means, for example, that we have um, digital twins, where we have you know, um, uh, digital replicas of a physical asset or a system or a system of systems that we can interact with um, in the digital world, either just to monitor what's going on or actually to interact and ch make changes in the digital world that will reflect in the physical world. Um, and we can access you know, digital twins, uh, uh, for example, using um, a traditional uh, um, a tablet or, or a smartphone or, 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 or computer, uh, or we can use virtual reality or augmented reality devices. They are just channels you know, to access the metaverse. They're not the metaverse. Mm -hmm. um, the other part is where the digital moves into the physical, uh, which is, of course, very much related to augmented reality, where we add a, a layer on top of the physical reality. and, and I actually think that that's a lot more interesting because we have a lot of opportunities to add nearly infinite layers. You know, we can use it for entertainment where we have, I don't know, a flying dragon or flying above the Sydney Opera House that you can only view with your phone or your smart glasses. Um, or we can use it for in the enterprise metaverse to have an overlay of a machine that we need to fix while the mechanic is not there. We can fix it ourselves because you know, the, the, the AR glasses will tell us exactly what to do. Um, so that's in a, in, a, in a nutshell uh, um, what the metaverse is. So it's the, the convergence of the physical and the digital, creating this 3D immersive internet. I've always envisioned the day that I can uh, put on a pair of glasses that look like regular reading glasses. And as I walk up to people in a group, uh, it will tell me who the person is, if I've had a conversation with them before, what that conversation was about, their spouse, their kids, and that can kind of feed me information that... I've already had that interaction. Like, I'm not really interested in the, like, I walk up to a random person and I know everything about them, but the people that I've had interactions with, that it will help me to stimulate my own memory recall. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I'm pretty sure it will happen. Um, uh, uh, whether that's good or bad um, remains to be seen, <laughs> but yeah. uh, um, I'm pretty sure it will happen, yeah. So I, I, I've heard lots of uh, anecdotal stories of, uh, let's use... Um, I guess in the reality is it's VR and the experiences that people are having in VR uh, online with uh, Facebook's metaverse, just kind of some horror stories of how people are behaving uh, it, on these platforms. So where do the risks do you see start uh, falling into place? Well, I, I think the, the, the problem with, with the metaverse is, is, or let's say just the next iteration of the internet is, you know, we end up in a world where we're creating a hundred times or a thousand times more data than we do today. Um, uh, we end up in a world that we 
not necessarily understand how to behave in that world. You know, we mm -hmm. don't understand how to behave in today's digital world, <laughs> um, um, let alone tomorrow's digital world. Um, and we can expect that all the problems and all the risks that we see in today's internet will be extrapolated in tomorrow's internet, um, plus a few more. Um, and um, um, I, I think you know, that's sort of the, the, the danger that I see happening. You know, um, We are sort of used to, to be able to think that we can shout everything we want on uh, social media. Mm -hmm. um, and we, uh, you, we bring that, that not so good behavior uh, to the metaverse where we think we can harass a woman in virtual reality uh, because we think that it doesn't have any effect on her uh, or him. Um, uh, but it does because, you know, um, if virtual reality is done in the correct way uh, with latency and, 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 and uh, um, screen rates and, you know, and, and high quality imagery um, um, to our brain, it can't, our brain can't make a distinction between physical and digital mm -hmm. between real and fake. So if, a person is being harassed in the virtual in virtual reality. To that person, it feels as if he or she is being harassed in the physical world. Um, and um, I think that's sort of the problem that we see happening in 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 the, in the digital world is that that we as we humans we think that they are two different things, um, and um, uh, we are you know uh, 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 invisible or, or you know uh, uh, not accountable for our actions uh, if it is if it happens in the digital world. Uh, which you know, um, to me is is I think a whole lot of bollocks. Um, and yeah. it's actually quite interesting because the next generation already thinks that there is no distinction between the physical and the digital. Um, to them, the physical is as important or less important than their digital world. Um, and um, um, and they, for them, you know, there is no distinction between the digital or real reality. So. Maybe we have a bit of an opportunity there to to change how we behave in the digital world, uh, but at the moment, unfortunately, we don't, um, and we still behave pretty pretty poorly um, in the digital world. Yeah, I, I was I was wondering that, like you and I are uh, of a certain age, and we have a perspective on this, and you know, our view of the internet is, you know, we grew up without the internet, at least in our kind of quote unquote formative years, it was not commonplace. Yet those that are in their 20s or 30s now, the internet has always been there. Online has always been there. Gosh, for some people, Facebook has always been there. Well, maybe they're not on Facebook anymore, but... <laughs> that, must, that must be so terrible. <laughs> <laughs> but, and, and I can see where there, there is less of a... You and I have can, can have a very distinct line of, this is online, this is offline, this is real world, this is the internet. But people growing up, uh, on the younger side of URI, those things are a lot more blended, and you know, kind of. Yes, that, 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 I think that's definitely true. But I think also for our generation, uh, people who have you know moved have seen the, the transition from analog to digital. Um, they also don't know how to behave in the digital yeah. world. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I re I recall that a couple of years ago, um, um, uh, someone published a pretty nasty. A review on my book on Amazon, which has had nothing to do with my book, um, and I um, um, I managed to find the person um, online because um, everything is public, <laughs> as, you, as you as you know. Uh, so I sent the gentleman a very nice email, like you know, like why why did you do that? Uh, blah blah blah. And he's like, oh, oh, I'm so sorry, I didn't know it was public, and blah blah blah. And you know, and then he removed it, which which I was happy that he removed it because yeah. uh, you know it, it didn't make sense. But it's 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 like. Hello. <laughs> Would you do the same thing if you're standing in front of me in the physical world and tell me that I'm, you know, whatever, whatever he wrote me? No, you wouldn't. Um, and I don't know. I, I think people just have this, 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 this. I don't know. This mask in front of them that they think that they are invisible and unaccountable if it's if it goes through a computer. You know, it just, for me, it just doesn't make sense. But yeah, that's the re reality we live in. Yeah, I mean, I mean, to me, that's. You know, you, you, you always assume that the person, whatever you write is going to be public and people are going to see it. Whatever you say, whatever you do is going to be seen and, and whatnot is generally the best way to behave in my mind. Yeah. But if, if younger people are kind of not seeing this difference between the physical and, and the internet, is that more of a problem for that generation or less of a problem? Because if well, you, can, you know, for, for you or I, I might just be able to, well, you know, I'm just going to turn off my phone for a day and I'm, you know, for a day or a couple of days and I'm not going to go on social media for a couple of days if I'm annoyed by something. But if so much more of your life and your identity is who you are online. 
Well, it, 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 it can be both ways. You know, yes, um, if you are, um, uh, if, if your digital reality, your digital identity is as important or more important than your physical identity, you would pay, you hope you would pay more attention to the reputation of your digital identity. Yeah. And you would not necessarily shout everything and anything to anyone um, in the digital realm. <clears throat> now, um, on the other, at the same time, it, it, them, it's also very difficult to disconnect from the digital reality because it yeah. is their physical reality and we can't disconnect from our physical reality. So, um, um, and that has also a downside and there's that we see there's plenty of research of all the downsides of people being fully, you know, um, um, addicted to TikTok and Instagram and, and et cetera. So I think that is, there, there are a lot of problems there. Um, it, it could mean um, uh, that people are, as I said, more um, aware of what they do and say online. Um, although that's, doesn't necessarily is the case because you know people publish all kinds of stupid things online, uh, which is a fair right, obviously. But it's 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 um, um, yeah, um, I, I think it's it, it goes both ways. So you mentioned addictions, and we definitely see uh, a lot a lot of good quality studies coming out about the amount of time that uh, teenagers spend on social media has uh, a fairly direct correlation with depression suicidal ideation, a, a lot of just negative real world things. Do you see all these getting uh, exponent, these problems becoming exponential in the metaverse? Well, I, I think so. If, if we have a, a, a an immersive TikTok, I think that would be a totally disaster yeah? <laughs> to, to have uh, the equivalent of the TikTok, but then for the metaverse, I think that would be really, really problematic. You know, uh, TikTok is just absolute crap, part of my French. <laughs> <laughs> um and um you know it's 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 there's there's um so much stuff going on that that's, that's really affecting um your children um, and they are not um, um they're not they're not um equipped to deal with it because you know their the, the, the brains are still growing um you know they don't they don't have the, the 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 warning signals that something is going on you know and they're just being uh, dragged into this into this 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 rabbit hole of of what's happening and all the videos um, and you quickly go down a path that you really don't want to go to um and uh, um, i think that's really problematic and we should protect our children because they can't they simply can't protect themselves because the, the, their brains are not you know um, ready yeah um, it, i think you know our brains do become fully formalized by, by the age of 25 or so so how can we expect a 13 year old um, in order to deal with the uh, flood of TikTok movies um, that he or she has been dragged into by the algorithm, um, um, going down a path that you don't, really don't want your 13-year-old kid to go down to. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a challenge I see with a lot of, gosh, it's not even just social media, but just media in general has become very much of an, an echo chamber and presenting well, a specific view and a direction of... Yeah. A specific well, presentation of like this is what life looks like when for ninety nine percent of us that's not what life is. Yeah, well, that, that that that's one thing. But the other thing I would argue is that you know uh, uh, we are also uh, the the parents are also um, you know pre preparing uh, um, our uh, the children in a very negative way. You know the amount of times that I see a pram with a phone stuck into the in front of the eyes of a one year old uh, watching a movie and the and the one year old can't look anywhere else can't do anything and just found only what can only watch that that stupid phone um um how well how, how do we expect that ch child to grow up and and then not to be adapted to the phone yeah. um, um uh, it always breaks my heart when i see that i you know uh, when i see parents do that you know why did you get children in the first place if you just give them the phone so that they're quiet i really don't understand it you know and mm -hmm. yes children is a hard work but then you shouldn't have <laughs> any children you know um and i i um, I, I think you know uh, we do that because we we are not fully aware of of the implications of what we're doing because nobody has told us what the implications can be if we go down that route. Um, and so, you to a certain extent, you can't blame anyone because nobody has been taught because mm -hmm. we sort of have we have we sort of been sleepwalking into this digital age, you know, um, uh, helped by big tech who created you know really easy to use seamless. Uh, 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 entertainment and tools uh, because, you know, we, we humans tend to be lazy. So if we have an easy to use tool, which happens to be free, um, then yes, we're going to use it, you know, and, and, and big tech knows very well that their technology is bad for humanity because they prohibit their own children to use it. So, um, you know, it's, 
yeah, uh, um, I do think there are, there are tremendous risks here. Um, and, and I think we should have more um, education um, um, uh, on how to, how to deal with these risks. So is, is some of this just, do you think is, you know, when we had, I'm, I'm going to make up cars here, our transition from horses to cars took uh, a, a fair amount of time and the rate that it seems, I mean, in my perception, the rate at which technology is increasing and implemented in our lives is just becoming faster and faster and faster and faster. Is that some of the reason why we haven't built that awareness is because we can't go to our parents and say, hey, you know, how did you help your kid not be addicted to an iPhone when, you know, well, we didn't I, even have I, them as kids? I, I think that's a very valid point. You know, we only have to look at ChatGPT, you know, 100 million users in two months' time. Um, that's, that's unheard heard of. Um, so all of a sudden, everyone is using this technology, which is a technology that's still being developed. Um, it's not ready. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's not battle tested. It's being battle tested by 100 million people of which a large chunk is children. Um, um, so I don't think that's necessarily a good idea. Um, and then I read this this morning that OpenAI now really wants to focus and and, 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 and um, go down the route of uh, you know, building artificial general intelligence, but we'll do so in a more secure way. Yeah, well, <clears throat> uh, OpenAI was meant to be open source and not for profit, but yeah, then Microsoft came by and <laughs> offered a big chunk of money. And that's, that's how it always goes, you know? Um, and uh, you know, you, you, we always start with the good. With most of the time, start with the good intentions. Um, uh, and then for, we forget about the unintended consequences. Um, and then somebody comes by with a with a big fat paycheck, and then we we happily accept that, and we just ignore what 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 mon potential monster we have built. Yeah. So, so how how do we go about uh, building that digital awareness? I guess first and foremost for ourselves, and then for the younger generation. Well, that, that's sort of what I'm trying to do with my uh, research institute that I founded is to 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 you know focus on education to help people understand what is happening, um, and um, uh, um, nobody nobody understands um, uh, really how the metaverse will have an impact or what the, what ChatGPT really does or you know we are we are all guinea pigs here trying to understand what this this all means, but. It, um, I think you know, just as we have to learn to drive a car, I think it would be useful that we learn how to um, uh, uh, be online. But nobody's teaching our children. Yeah. You know, nobody. Um, um, I didn't have any classes uh, um, about ethical behavior or how to, how to behave. Not even ethical behavior. How to behave yeah. uh, in a digital world. Um, and um, I, I'll be, I, I don't have school go school going children at the moment. But I, I'm not sure if that's if it happens at the moment that people are being taught how to behave in a digital world. And, um, you know, you can't blame anyone because the parents don't know and the, and the teachers don't know, but yeah. we, we really need to do that. Um, and I think it's problematic that we don't. Yeah, and, and I think the challenge is you, you made the analogy of like learning to drive a car. I think it's one level more complex than that is learning to drive a car while the engineers are still figuring out how to build the car and how it actually works. Yes. I mean, yes. if you think it's annoying that Tesla changes the UI and your car behaves a little bit differently, you know, this is this is an order of magnitude more complex yeah. in that. You're like, driving they, and all of a sudden your steering wheel moves to the right. <laughs> <laughs> you, you turn left and the car goes right all of a sudden. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not like chat GPT is this is a finished product. Eh, we're This is just research. We're just playing with this. And it yeah. kind of feels the same way with vr ar the metaverse because they're emerging products or concepts that they're they're you know no one's thought about the rules yet because i'm, I'm just still trying to figure out how to build the darn thing yeah yeah and i think that's pretty problematic yeah it's a uh, it's 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 kind of weird that um you know um, um, we allow this to happen you know and we shouldn't stifle innovation and we should embrace innovation and yeah you know, i'm all for for that um, um, uh, approach but we should still should think what what we're doing here you know um and um, um a, a seasoned um, a researcher who understands how to use new technology uh, might be able to um, explore a new technology in a way that that we can understand it but a 13 year old doesn't yeah. um, he or she doesn't know how to deal with new technology so should we should we give a, a chainsaw to a 13 year old um, not teaching uh, him or her how to use it. Yeah. 
I don't think so. But <laughs> and, and, and then upgrade it once a week. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so do you see kind of a future where technology companies need to have? Oh, I, I hate the, the idea of government mandates in a sense, but that there's a certain amount of uh, you need to have an ethicist involved in your product design to think about the the consequences on on the on society and the social aspect of it, not just the technical aspects of it. Um, I think so. You know, I'm 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 not a big fan of of, of too much government in, in uh, you know influence um, as well. But we we do need to have because it, it it's not the market that's going to do this. You know, the yeah. the market has zero incentive to do this. Big tech has zero incentive to um, uh, incorporate uh, blockchain technology, so we own our own data. You know, they have zero incentive to make uh, their products less sticky. Uh, you know, they have. Um, 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 so, if that's the case, then we maybe we should you should not necessarily force organizations to do ABC, but at least to force organizations to have an ethicist or to have um, a, a review board or to have um, the, have their AI checked on uh, by an independent auditor, um, uh, whether it's biased or not. Um, that, I think, is a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, and then we still have free market and we still have, you know, those kind of things, which I think, is, which, which I think are important because let's not forget that the government has no clue what's happening either. Yeah. Um, so um, to, to, to have the government create mandates about a topic that they don't have a clue about doesn't seem to be a good idea to me. Um, uh, uh, but we can still have, we, we, we should, you know, um, uh, require um, organizations to, to do more work with this. Uh, let's, let's give an example. Yeah, I've done a PhD um, at the University of Technology here in Sydney. And when I did wanted to do my research, I had to get approval from the board of the ethics board. Um, you know, and that's a pretty rigorous process. Um, and only when I had that approval, I could, do my research. Mm -hmm. um, why can't you know corporations have such uh, such a such a uh, you know uh, committee? Uh, but then a committee that has that has act actual power, you know, not yeah. that you just can ignore as, as with Facebook and with with any of the other ones, um, but but an actual committee that holds power. Why can't that? That's something I think that the government can mandate, uh, yeah. where we say, well, you have to have a board of an ethics committee, and the ethics committee has to have real power. Um, um, and if if you don't do that, you you get fined. Uh, I don't know, five percent, ten percent of your of your annual revenue, whatever. Um, um, and then we still have free market. We still allow you how to organize it yourself, but you have to have that. And there has to be a review process that that you know we that's actually being um, um, uh, followed up upon. I think that I think would be very very important. And um, but that, uh, so that that that's one angle. The other angle is the education that that yeah. we should that we you and I uh, general public uh, that we are aware that we can also vote with our own data that we can that we are in, in control. Although it's very very difficult to be in control, but we yeah. are in control. You know, we don't have to use Google. We don't have to use TikTok. Um, yes, they've made it super addictive, and yes, nobody told us not not to use it, but we don't have to use it. Um, and and that, that requires a lot more education that there's also other things that we can do. I can kind of see some parallels between um, uh, ethical uh, product manufacturing in terms of like testing on animals that the companies really didn't change that policy until they faced pressure from the public of we're not going to buy your products if you test on cute little furry rabbits. And we're starting to see that I think on the environmental level as well of like hey if you don't treat the environment well if you don't if you know if you're producing 10 billion pounds of paper trash every month when you can do everything electronically we're just not going to buy your products anymore do you see that that something like that is going to be the most pressure that these companies can do of, uh, of people can do is like if you don't have an ethicist on staff and you listen to them and they're on your board of directors we're just not going to buy your products i mean they're always going to be someone who will but you know, will will the will the squeaky wheel start talking about having ethicists on boards? I I I, I sincerely hope so. You know, it, it's one of the things that with my institute I want to focus on is 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 creating some kind of um, a, a, a B corp style certification, but then a D corp style, like mm -hmm. digital corporation that we that we that we um, uh, uh, that that it becomes interesting for for an organization to to, to become. B Corp style certified, mm -hmm. which means that you 
um, um, you, 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 your AI is unbiased and you, you protect your data um, and you don't build technology that, that's you know, addictive in, in, in negative ways. Uh, um, and then as long as people don't know, okay, Corporation A is certified in, in, in a digital responsible way, and Corporation B is not, let's go for Corporation A. Um, and then, uh, but this is a very long, long-term game, yeah. obviously. Yeah. Um, but that's, I think that that would be a direction that that would help. And but that we still would need to educate people yeah. why it's better to go with Corporation A and not with Corporation B. You know, so it it needs both both worlds. Um, and that's why I'm I'm trying to bring it all together um, to to make that happen. So, so with this, you know, drive for digital awareness. How do you change with the technology? I mean, education is one of those fields where it's, you know, it's, it's not like everyone has a textbook that was printed last week. Education obviously usually has, you know, 10, 15 year lifespans of using particular sets of books and, and courses. How do you change that so that we're teaching digital awareness that's current as opposed to, okay, kids, there's this thing that's called Twitter and it's brand new. And, you know, it allows you to tweet 140 characters, not, not 4,000, not 288, you know, <laughs> like yeah, yeah. how do we keep the education current with what's actually happening in the real world? Well, by embracing the technology that this need, that it, it's educating about, you know, um, uh, we have all these fantastic technologies um, um, that we can also use to, Educate people about those fantastic technologies. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we can we, we education can use these technologies. You know, we don't have to be afraid of it. You know, and then I, I find that one of the most remarkable things that there are so many schools around the world to say we are going to ban ChatGPT. Yeah. No, doofus, you shouldn't ban it. You should embrace it. You should ask different questions, and you should change your educational system because the children are going to use it. So you cannot ban the future. You know, you have to. Um, um, ad adapt and adopt the new technologies and um, adapt your curriculum um, so so you, we teach our children um, how to use these technologies yeah. and there, there are some schools in the world who do really well who try to embrace and say you have to use JetGPT but you have to uh, 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 say that you do so uh, you have to be transparent in how you used it um, and it still has to be factual correct yeah. Um, so you still have to do your research, um, and 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 that's we create an assignment around that. And if you don't use ChatGPT, you fail. But if you <clears throat> use ChatGPT and you don't say it, you fail as well. So yeah. You, you you get a different approach, and I think that is very relevant. And I think that's very very important. And that's how you can change um, the education system. So how do we educate um, about future technologies by using future technologies? embrace them and figure out where they're good and where they're bad. I mean, it's, yeah. I, like I've run across the same thing playing around with ChatGPT is that some stuff looks good until you start fact checking and you realize, yeah. oh, no, no, that's that that's an outdated statement. Maybe that was true 10 years ago, but it's definitely not true now. Well, it, 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 it comes with complete nonsense, you know. Yeah, um, I, at, at some uh, at some point, I asked it about myself. You know, I've written several academic papers, so I, I and several books. So I said, to him, you know, um, how many academic papers has 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 Mark written? Um, and it came back. Well, Mark has written two books, which is not not entirely correct. So I've written five. Um, and Mark has written three academic papers, which is correct. I have written three academic papers that are published in in, in well known journals. But then I just came up with these three random academic papers that was blockchain and xyz ai and xyz big data and xyz uh, which had nothing to do well it's related to technology that i researched but it, was, and it just didn't exist it's just complete nonsense um and i'm like this is so frustrating and then and, and you and i might be able to to see that but most people don't um and um you know and then and that's, that's that's one thing that i think is also important to mention is we are moving to a, a voice era. We move into a world where um, uh, we use our voice to ask questions about the internet and to yeah. get an answer back. Uh, in today's world, if we ask a question, we go to Google or Bing or whatever, whatever search engine, we post the question, we get a list of 10 results plus another 50 pages that we ignore. <laughs> but at least we have you know, 10 results and we can move through and, and have at least some influence about the decision we make based on those 10 results. Yeah. Now imagine a world where the chat GPTs of this world replace this, the search engine we don't get those 10 anymore. We just get yeah. one answer. And and uh, we are, as I said, we are lazy. So 99% of the people will trust that one answer, even if it's wrong. 
Um, so that's problematic for consumers. It's also problematic for brands because all of a sudden, instead of fighting for the top 10, you now have to fight for the top one. Yeah. Um, and you have um, zero understanding. It's very opaque of how how that number one is being selected, even, even more vague than it is today with the search engine. So we're moving to a world where big tech becomes even more powerful because um, I really want to, as a brand, really want to be brought forward. So I'm probably willing to pay yeah. um, uh, 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 a ton of money so that um, uh, when a consumer asks question X, Y, Z, I am being recommended and not my competitor. So, um, and this is going to be all very opaque, very vague. Nobody knows what's happening behind the scenes. Um, I think that's problematic. Yeah, and we and we see that in the kind of the product review space is that you now have companies that make products buying the companies that are reviewing the products. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, and they and something else, and some of them rightly disclose, hey, we're now owned by you know this company, and we're we're recommending their product. But a lot of them don't disclose those sort of things, and yep. so it's like, yeah, how, and do, even, you, but even how if do you, you trust? Disclose, yeah, and even but even if you disclose it, it's often written in in a micro form that you need yeah. a, a, a telescope to read, <laughs> or it's it, it's in the about us. Hey, you know, five years ago, yeah, yeah. last year, we were acquired by this company, and of course, no one knows the company by the holding company name until you research it, and yeah, yeah. yeah. So if you're getting answers. If you're solely trusting those types of sources, it becomes problematic. As Which you'd... a lot of people do because yep. we're lazy um, um, and um, as, as human beings. Um, um, so yeah, um, I think that's uh, challenging. Yeah. <laughs> so so are we just in for a dark, horrific future? What what's the bright point here? <laughs> Uh, well, look, I'm I'm a, I'm a very optimistic person, um, and um, but I'm also really scared about the digital future. Um, mm -hmm. I, I will not deny that because uh, you know I, um, I can think exponentially. I can I can see how technology are converging, um, and it um, I can see what is required to ensure a thriving digital future. Um, and I can see, knowing what I what what I look back in history, uh, that what is required is very very difficult to achieve, and really requires a collective. Um, um, action that is very difficult to achieve because the the, the powers to that be uh, don't really like that direction, yeah. you know. Um, uh, so it's it it requires a lot of work from from you and me, from the general public. Now that's all possible, um, but it's 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 it, it requires a lot of work, and we need to start today to 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 make that happen. Um, and you know, it's 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 not that you know. Um, the only future is a dystopian future. Yeah. Uh, we still have a chance, but but we really need to act now. So when you so when you say people need to act now, what are three things that someone should or shouldn't do in their own life with respect to the the the, the, the whether it's the metaverse or the technification, <laughs> the, the 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 speed at which technology is approaching them and how they handle it. Um, well, I'd like to sh shift the question slightly, if I may, yeah. um, uh, because um, um, I think there are three things that we need to do as a society um, uh, to, to make this happen. And, and the first one is obviously education. Yeah. So uh, we need to educate ourselves on this new technology. And that means we yeah. we need to um, uh, experiment. We need to explore these new technologies. We need to think about what we do, what what we're doing, what we're experimenting with, um, and we need to try to understand what's happening. You know, um, if you want to, as I said, the chainsaw, if you if, if I have to use a chainsaw, I, I'd rather first read the manual to understand how it works so I don't chop off my fingers. Um, and, 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 and so a good example of this would be like parents should install TikTok on their phone. Not that I'm saying you should install it, uh, but install it, play with it, see what it is, see how it works. And so you have an understanding of what your kid is going to face. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that That's an absolute bare minimum, I would I would argue. That at least you understand what your kids are doing, um, and yeah, that requires work from from the parents. And yes, you don't always have the time to do that, or you don't always feel like doing that. But I think it would benefit you as well as your children to actually do so. Yeah. So the second one is verification. We need to start to verify what we're doing. So that means verification if, uh, in terms of uh, are we dealing with an AI? Are we dealing with fake news? Are we dealing with AI generated content? Um, 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 is this AI biased or not? Um, uh, um, am I dealing with the person who he or she says that he or she is, yeah. uh, which will become a lot more problematic in the metaverse than it is today already? Um, and and, and uh, do we need like NFTs for that? Do we need to use biometrics for that? Do we need uh, how do we ensure the accountability? Um, and this is partially um, uh, a consumer side, 
consumer requirement to verify, but also partially um, enterprise and government requirements uh, to verify that the AI is unbiased, that, that we can trust who we're dealing with. So that's the second part. Um, and the third part is then regulation. Uh, so education, verification, regulation, uh, where, uh, as we stated before, you know, not regulation that stifles innovation, yeah. but regulation that requires organizations to have a board of ethics, to have an oversight board, uh, or to have um, uh, uh, their, their AI checked by an independent auditor, just like we check our finances by an independent auditor, and we hold the independent auditor accountable for the audits they are performing. Um, um, and I think uh, that is something that, that's I've been pulling out for over a decade now already. Yeah. We, 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 we need that. You know, we, we um, I don't need to know how an AI works. I just need to know that I can trust that AI. Um, yeah. Just that I don't need to know if I want to invest in the public company, um, how their finances work. I just need to know that I can trust whatever their finances have been delivered. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and the same thing we need to get for, uh, for uh, anything digital. And I don't think that's, that's too much to ask. You know, um, um, uh, we've been able to to require um, accountancy firms to 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 you know sign for the the audits that they perform um, for public companies. So why can't we do that for public comp public tech companies? Yeah. No, I, I think those are all very reasonable uh, first steps. I, th I think there's a lot more we're going to have to do in the long run. But at least that's a great place to get started. Yeah, that's what I think as well. <laughs> <laughs> so if people, as we wrap up here, if people want to find you online, where can they find you? Well, I'm, I'm pretty visible online. So I'm, I've written about a thousand articles, I think. So you can you can all, all read those. Uh, but you can find me on uh, thedigitalspeaker.com uh, where you can find all my, all, all my content. Uh, I'm on Twitter as well. I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, feel free to reach out. Uh, happy to connect. And we'll make sure to link to all those in the show notes and obviously the book, Step Into the Metaverse, available anywhere, anywhere, any fine places where you can buy books, either digitally or electronically. Absolutely. <laughs> or physically. <laughs> or phys yes. Mark, thank you so much for coming on the Easy Prey podcast today. Thanks for having me, Chris. It's been a, an absolute joy. <laughs>